Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to for another 3ds Max tutorial video with me Rob. So when last I left you we had just finished modeling the rubber of that tire and uh, uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances I had to stop a little bit earlier before being able to get to the rim. Uh, I've also been asked by one of our wonderful viewers to uh, go into the rendering so I'm going to take a quick look at mental ray materials and rendering uh, so that you can easily slap some textures onto this and get some sort of an output. So, uh, let's go ahead and switch over to our 3ds Max scene. Hello everybody! So this is about where we left off last time, right? So we had done the treads, we had put the good dog tires writing and bent it around so that it's the curvature of the tire wall and then the curvature around the tire and got that all done through bends and repetition and just some chop modeling. So now we're going to put in what's in the middle here. So uh, rims come in all shapes and sizes. Here let's hide the t exercise tire and bring back the one I had built. So if you're doing like a truck tire or a uh, wheelbarrow, something that's uh, maybe a spare tire, this is kind of the rim that you're going to see, right? It's a lot, uh, it's a lot simpler. It's, uh, you know, there's nothing very fancy about it. You're not going to show this off to your friends. Hey, check out these mags I just bought, bro. Like, isn't this freaking awesome? No, no, it's really not. Uh, but then some people have... Uh, whoops, come on back. I have something like this, and I put, uh, you know, a little bit of time into this. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details here, but I'll certainly show you how to get started with this. And uh, a lot of it can be just play, right? For this shape, I wasn't trying to recreate a particular uh, rim pattern. I was just uh, having some fun and, uh, and trying out some shapes. So uh, we're going to do uh, something similar to this, a little bit more along the sports tire rather than the replacement tire, uh, but uh, not quite as complex as this. It's not going to be this quite an open design. So let's go ahead. We're going to hide all that. We're going to unhide the exercise. And um, so to look at a rim, uh, I'm going to use this just for a general shape, right? So to get the size about right. Because where these bolts are in the middle, that's not going to change much from car to car. Whether you get, uh, you know, the the spare tire or the sports mags or the whatever other rims, these bolts aren't going to be moving because that's a standard part that's on the chassis of the car, on the the under workings, the inner workings of the car, and then that's just the the thing that holds the tire on uh, to the axle so it's the the rim can get really snazzy but what's inside doesn't change so we want to make sure that that inside part isn't going to be any different so uh, we're going to just go ahead first off we're going to turn off perspective so that we don't get weird differences in sizes and we're going to go ahead and create a cylinder so i'm just gonna wobble one out there and uh, actually this is the the format that you're gonna want so I'm putting it so that there's uh, three by three so there's three polygons that make up the face there's three polygons that make up the side and we're just gonna align that Woo. over there center to center and we are gonna rotate that make sure that you are rotating from center because by default it's probably gonna be from there and you're gonna be rotating it from that back face but since we're already center center rotating from center should get this to stay right in the middle of that and it doesn't need to be wider than the tire so we bring it back so that it's just a little bit wider than that inner lip right the the tire rim is gonna sit right about there and make sure that's good on both sides. That's decent. And of course, it rim is not going to go out wider than the uh, outer tire itself. So we'll just pull back the radius a little bit to about there. And at this point, right click, convert to editable poly. And 
the rim is going to be open in the middle. So we just select those polys and click delete. And that gives us a nice opening in the middle. So we can now grab the borders, grab those two. We're going to bridge with settings, make sure that's just one edge. That's good. And we grab those and bridge. All right. So next, um, oftentimes this, and we're going to grab my angle, ignoring back facing. No, no. Just that. Hey, stop being stupid. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, this also we're going to just inset this a little bit and I'm actually going to grab this face and I'm going to move this in and over here we're going to grab these edges, right click and connect them together. And we're kind of going to have this go from the back reaching forward to the front. And we're going to put a little bit of a spin on each of the uh, spokes. So we're going to make this two, uh, three even. And we're going to slide this towards the back. Let's squeeze them together even a little bit more. And look at that. Okay, and the same thing over here. We're going to need something for that to connect to. So we're going to just connect like that. But these we're going to, oops, that was at 18. And we're going to slide these actually to the front edge. So it's there's a heavy gap between the front and the back. Now, when I created this, Oh my, did I even create it correctly? Yeah, wrong. Yeah, right. Yes. Okay, so wh when I created this, I didn't look at the numbers, but uh, it should have held on. But this is a 16, turn off these so that we just get that. It is 16 sided. And I chose 16 sided because that breaks up nicely into fours, right? Because if you're thinking in quads and uh, four sided shapes, then uh, 16 is four fours. And that means that we've got one, two, three, four to a 90 degree. And that makes it really nice and easy to break it down, make, uh, make equal spacing around for the, the different spokes. Of course, if you have a particular spoke design in mind, for instance, if you actually were gonna be doing this one, a four, uh, breaking it down into four may not be helpful. So you'll probably want for this one to break it to uh, a 20 sided shape, which breaks down into five a lot more easily. And you'll, uh, you'll more easily be able to recreate that shape. But like I was saying, those bolts are going to be uh, just about always the same size. So we've pretty much got it here. Uh, we could even make that shape just slightly smaller, but we're not going to so we can get rid of that plane <laughs> and so let's think about bridging these so having broken it down by eight that makes it break down nicely to two skip two two skip two and we just go around skip two grab two and uh, you notice i didn't only make it two polys side by side because when i've by putting an extra edge loop down the middle, now I've got two edges on each side, and that makes it connect a lot more intelligently. Right? If there's if there's not the same number of of edges per side, then the bridging tool can has a, have a hard time deciding what is supposed to connect to what. And then you end up getting weird things like the bridge going from this hole to this hole instead of bridging across there. So now, because those are evenly spaced, evenly edged, I should be able to just come up here to bridge settings and everything goes straight out to the sides. So, uh, 
So now you can see simply bridging and I've already got uh, you know an, an isometrical shape and that could be believable as a, a tire um, design but we're gonna push it a little, little farther and actually before we bridge that um, I am going to do this and make this inner ring bigger right it doesn't need to be quite that fat it definitely needs to be inside of that tire. So that's that's a better size, I find. And makes for that, you know, the thin wall uh, rim, which is a pretty interesting design, I think. So now, now that this is bridged, we can do some really interesting stuff to this and keep it symmetrical, make it look like we've actually cut out circles or make a leaf pattern or whatever, just by playing with these bridging tools. So for starters, you might start you know, sliding these numbers around and notice that nothing's happening. Oh, well, why isn't bias doing anything? Well, if it doesn't do anything, then why is it there? Well, that has to do with how many segments, because it's about the curvature of the bridge, right? If you think about literally a bridge that crosses, uh, you've got uh, an edge on one side of the river and an edge on the other side of the river. Now that bridge, if you're walking across it this way, it might be a perfectly straight line from one side to the other, which is what we're getting here. It's a perfectly straight line from one edge to another. But you might want that bridge to come in and back out, or you might want it to bulge out and come back in, depending on what you're doing. And that can be really interesting, but we need extra edges in here to make sure that there, there's geometry to work with. So I'm gonna put that up to uh, six, uh, just to be able to show you. So if I start, tapering outwards then you start seeing that I'm getting this um, uh, a leaf pattern kind of right it looks uh, kind of like a like a flower that's being repeated around and that could easily be used to create flowers and by changing the bias we can determine just how sharply or rounded that's going and actually that also kind of makes uh, you know the um, almost like Celtic cross that's used in like Orange County chopper symbols and stuff like that. So let's just reset that. And if we taper inwards, sorry, my headset keeps beeping at me and I can't determine what it is because the sound is always on. Maybe they're getting low on batteries. Uh, sorry, anyhow. Uh, so by tapering it inwards, then we're getting some interesting shapes there and we can play with that bias so that it kind of you know, it seems to be you know, making a, a double bulge there, almost like a wine glass shape, or make it more uh, straight as it goes to the sides. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking that's kind of cool. Uh, oh, actually, before I do that, let's undo that, and we can just bridge with settings. Another fun thing and another reason why you'll want to have the same number of edges per side of the shape is if you want to twist. So twisting, uh, most twisting is going to be by degrees, but this one you see is, is staying in fairly small numbers. So what it's doing is actually offsetting which edge is bridging to which, right? So this edge is straight opposite this edge, so by default those two are going to go together. But I could say, no, 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 I want this edge to bridge to that one, and this one to bridge to that one, and this one to bridge. So it ends up creating kind of a spiral, and you see if I step one over, you can see exactly that it's this edge connecting down to here. This front edge is actually not connecting to a side. This first side edge is connecting to this side that side edge is connecting to the back and it's just transposing which bordered edge is it uh, connecting to. I turn that off, that's kind of cool. I'm going to step up the smoothing a little bit. And maybe I'll keep it unsmooth. And then from here I am going to grab, I'm going to just put this down to 25, which is generally where I start. Uh, we can sh 
shrink that a bit, shrink that, we'll pull this one out, and just play around with some of these shapes, we can extrude that inwards, and maybe do a bevel inwards there. Put a turbo smooth on top. Okay, so um, I do kind of feel like it's just going back, and I kind of feel like it's not providing a lot of support to the 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 outer supports are not providing a lot of support to the outside of the wheel, which could be okay. Why does this thing keep beeping at me? <laughs> so what we're gonna do is just grab this whole front edge of the rims here, the spokes rather, and we're just going to pull that forward a bit more. Is that good? Yeah, that's pretty good. And then we're going to put in some control loops. So, uh, control click, control shift click, control to add, control shift to add loop, control to add, control shift to add loop. And then we're going to connect these together one time in the middle and we'll slide it towards the outside. Make sure those are all going outside because sometimes one is pushing outside while one is pushing inside, depending on uh, what geometry you're working with. So get that going. We're also going to put a swift loop along the front edge of this and the back edge of these to control how they come off. And the same idea over here. And that basically already has a control edge on the front. Yeah, I'll add another one just to be sure. Okay, so now as we turbo smooth, as we turbo smooth, right, that's making a little bit of a, a sharper shape, and it's, that's not so bad. And the next thing we're going to do is start playing a little bit more. So we're going to grab everything just past those control loops. Oh, I've still got ignore back facing on, so I didn't actually get these back facing edges. Polys, uh, vertices is the word I'm looking for. Okay, so that's what we want there. And now we're going to rotate that, so we're going to give it a little bit of a dynamic, uh, you know, a movement dynamic. So to do that, we're going to turn on soft selection, because if we don't, if we just start rotating that, it's it's going to make a very harsh edge there, and it's, it's going to take some work to get that back cleaned up. Uh, now, you may want that hard edge, and that's totally your prerogative, and depending on the tire model that you're doing, that might be what you're looking for. But I'm going to turn on soft selection and pull back the distance so that it's not going all the way out to this outer rim, but is getting pretty darn close, right? You can see the, the green part of the fall off is not quite at the outer rim. So now when we rotate it, you see we're getting an interesting stretch. And we can play around with this, right? We can play around with the pinch. And uh, you can see the graph over here adjusting accordingly. That's pretty cool. And if we turn on our turbo smooth, yeah. So from this back part, uh, again, turn off our turbo smooth. We'll probably want to grab like, again, not by angle, so we can grab that edge. Whoa. See, turn off soft selection. And I did a shift instead of an extrude. And that extrusion should probably be about back to there, I think. Yeah, 
So let's put a couple of, again, control loops in there. We can grab these edges like this, connect twice, and roll up the pinch to push them apart. And another little swift loop on the inside like that. So you see now when we're turbo smoothing, it keeps a nice hard edge there. And again, turn off our cage. I don't know why that always feels like it has to be on. Okay, so we've got a little bit of a width issue here on the top. So we're going to grab that, grow, so we've got that entire outer bit and we'll just scale horizontal to give that a little bit of width. Okay, so now um, there's an awful lot of just straight edges so we're gonna do some interesting stuff to it so let's let's try a chamfer, add an extra edge We can accept that, and then this will actually move in a little bit and make it wider. Make sure not to make it too wide. And then another couple of support loops. Because we don't want this to get too bulbous. And if it starts getting bulbous, then things are going wrong, really. You want this to be fairly sharp as it comes around these corners. Yes, there is. Okay, so if we go to the front and make this a little bit wider. And we're even going to do a little bit of a inset, extrude. still by group. We want by local normal. Squeeze that together. Okay, so you can take as long as you want or as little time as you want to start to continue making this even more interesting. You know, you can cut holes out of these, which uh, can be fun. Let's, hey, why not? Let's go ahead and do that. So you're, we're going to grab four front and back. Make sure you've got the same four <laughs> front and back and that you're not grabbing, you know, further up the, uh, the spiral. And we can do an inset on all of these and then delete. We'll grab our borders, grab those two borders, and we should be able to just ah, see, we're back up at that six. We just need a two. And we've got that taper going on. What if we do that? I'm not crazy about what's happening there. Oops. 
this egg. Got stuck on another screen. <laughs> yeah, not so crazy about how that's going. So we're just going to leave it at that. So again, add details as, uh, as much as you want. Uh, the idea is just to kind of give you an idea of how to get started here. So now we're going to go ahead and render this. So uh, we'll give it a quick scene. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll put it on a ground. And again, from the front, we can turn on the grid just to be able to see that. It's not really necessary. And this box, we'll just push it back a little bit. Hold shift, rotate it up 90 degrees, and we've got our vertical wall. And we'll just move this in so that they're just a little bit intersecting. We'll grab these two, rotate it just so that it's a little bit dynamic. And we'll turn this over to realistic. So now we've, we get a shadow coming down and uh, here I made a little stand thing like those two I'll grab this stand thing move down because when you see tires on display it's generally going to be on a little floor stand just like this one or on a rack up on a wall perhaps but uh, this floor stand is pretty common and is pretty easy to make, right? To, to create that. Here, I'll even move it back to where it was lined up for that other thing. And we'll just add that environment. So to create that, uh, basically what I did was uh, go to the top, turn on my grid, turn on snapping by pressing S. I right click on snapping to switch to grid points. And then we can go from here. Uh, we'll go to there. There. And you see, by snapping to grid, I get ver a very geometric shape very easily. And so now we'll come into the vertex mode. Uh, we're going to grab these two. And from back, we can move these to there. Whoa, we did some weird. Oh, so let's just grab this one. understand how sometimes it wants to show up sometimes it doesn't so instead we're going to turn off snapping grab those two dots come over here and we're just going to rotate them up like this make it roughly accurate but then I'm just going to select all these and we want it planar to X planar with just those two dots so just scale along X keep dragging it a good couple of times and uh, that's gonna make it flat why are you putting those together you silly thing here we go okay those two scale along X these two scale along X. Then we're going to do rendering, expand rendering over here on the line. We can enable in viewport, but we also want to enable in a renderer to make sure that we actually do see it. So rotate it up at 90 degrees. We'll align it up to our rim. Center, center is fine because we're just getting an estimate. Oh, but you see what happened? It flipped it right upside down. So again, we're going to align to there but turn off these 
axes, and then that way it's not going to be rotated, it's just going to be moved over. Turn off that grid. So that could come down. And in here, you can talk about, you know, what is the radial thickness of this? Uh, how many sides are there? It actually doesn't need 12. I think just uh, 8 will do. And on instead of converting it, I'm just going to put an edit poly on top. And uh, that makes it pretty easy to work with, and it's immediately there and available for you. So, um, you know, more than four sides, it's not a good thing, so we're just going to delete these caps, grab the borders here, and we'll scale from each locally, and we'll just world scale in, those boards work just fine. Switch to edge. And actually, we should be able to just grab those two out and switch. Oh, because I probably have that other side selected as well. So come back to edge mode. Those two, those two, those two. Same over here, or we can do it on the opposite diagonal for consistency's sake. Bridge those together. And uh, now on the original, I had little rubber leg things that were helping to support it and keep it only slightly off the ground, so we can easily add those. With a little swift loop, we'll just add, select those guys, connect. Whoa, we'll make sure that we're along edge on that. We'll scale by world so that it's nice and front to back. And scale that back. So we can now slide that along. Actually, we're going to slide this along backwards because that way we can easily just use our swift loop and add a couple of edges there. Actually, even better idea is to grab these edges, right click connect, do it twice, and about like that. That way it's the same distance on both sides. Uh, another way to do it would be to not make this an entire V, but rather just an arm that comes down and angles forward and then put a symmetry down the middle, and that will make it the same on both sides. So now we're going to grab a couple of faces. So we'll grab these ones in front, these ones in front, and then this loop here, because that's what's going to get the rubber. So these basically just extrude by local normal there you have it so just to sharpen up the edges once it comes time to turbo smooth this we'll grab all those connect to make that a little bit wider and we're going to do a similar thing so that when it comes off of the rubber, it's also got its protection for turbo smooth. So that one we want to have quite close there. And then we're going to put a swift loop there. And I think just there will be fine. And then one very close over here and up there. And this back part's probably not going to be seen all that much, but let's just put a couple in there for shits and giggles. 
and make sure it's not clipping right through the tire. And we can move this down again. Just so that those are just barely touching the ground. Okay. So if you haven't yet, then you should definitely be saving. So let's go ahead and save. And uh, have that move back a little bit further. Just give it a little more room. So uh, one handy thing that you can do is assign multiple material, uh, a, a multi-sub object material onto something. So uh, a multi or sub object means that one object is going to take multiple materials. And what that's going to allow us to do is to use these mental ray materials to have both silver or chrome as well as a black rubber. Because normally speaking, if I apply a material over here, here, let's take this brown one, uh, you see the whole thing is being set with a color. Now I could select, you know, certain faces and say, okay, apply this to only that, but it, it doesn't work very well. So what we're going to do actually is, oh, we've got a good selection, right? Because we used that selection to do an extrusion, it's already there. So all I need to do is do one grow so that we get the sides of our rubber as well. And we're going to come over here, Polygon Material ID. So we're going to set ID, not select, but set ID to two. So that means those polygons are going to have a two. Uh, the, the second material on there. And so you see here is a multi-sub object. So I can have a whole big pile of materials. I can set how many there are. So I actually only need two. So if I click two and say okay, there's only two. And so I, uh, I have those already set up. We're going to reset them up. So it's just to say you can have one object with multiple materials and then each of those materials you can set how many times it's going to tile and repeat over and uh, you know without having to mess around with the, with the other one so that as you're upping one tiling you're not upping the other tiling. So uh, speaking of rendering, uh, so the first thing you want to do to set up rendering is press F10. And then you get this, this render setup. And by default, you're not going to have it on mental ray. I have it on mental ray already. You're going to have it as default scan line. And all these are just going to be default materials. So when you start off, there's a good chance, assignment to selection, you're going to have something like this. And um, you're probably not even going to have that high of a resolution. You're probably going to be at like 640 by 480 default scan line. And there's an awful lot of settings here that can be a, a little bit intimidating. And to render, either click the render button at the bottom or press F9. And this render setup is also up here under rendering, render setup, and it tells us right there, F10. So when I press F9, zadoo. Oh yes, uh, you know what? I am going to I'm going to make a couple of other changes here, just to uh, unhide everything and now I can delete these lights and this camera. We can delete those, we can delete that. Just getting rid of all my junk. I don't need that, I don't need that. Right, lots of stuff that I don't need. So, and that can also be deleted. Don't is that everything? No, it's not actually. I've got an extra 
that one? Nope, it's this one underneath that was old. See, normally this stand, it just has a pole that goes into the, uh, the hub of the tire and takes care of that. All right, so we've got our, our scene with walls. So find a good angle. So you can hold shift and press F like frame or uh, foxtrot and you'll get your uh, safe frames. Press P to come into perspective and now kind of move this around until you've got a framing that you're happy with. So you want to have something that you can see the treads, you can see the, the, the writing on the side and then you're not seeing off the side of the set and that makes it a little bit more believable and uh, that you're actually looking at an object in the world and not just, um, well, a 3D render of some junk that you decided to put together. So we can even move these. I'm on edge mode, aren't I? Yes, I am. So just move these down a little bit and that way you'll see right through. Okay. So let's come to our material editor and we're just going to scroll down and uh, yeah, whatever. We're just going to ignore all the other materials that I have up there and we're just going to grab a, a nice blank one. It's got nothing special. It's got no colors, no, no information whatsoever. Uh, so, and we're going to want to keep that F10 uh, render setup open. So, we don't need to crank up the resolution too high right now because it's kind of good keeping it low so that we get quick renders and then when we have the settings that we want we can crank it up to the max and and then get what we want at that point oh yes also that needs its turbo smooth there we go nice and pretty now so we're going to be doing mental ray which requires very specific renderer which is the mental ray renderer. So all the way at the bottom of this render setup, there's assign renderer. Click on the tr three dots and select NVIDIA mental ray. And there's, it's gonna do a little shift in the lighting while it uh, gets things ready. And that's the only way that you're gonna be able to find mental ray materials. If you don't have the mental ray renderer selected, you won't be able to select mental ray materials. Similarly, there's a thing in there called eye ray, um, which needs eye ray materials, and that's good for also uh, cinematic, realistic lighting, all that. So this time we're not gonna be working with a standard material, we're working with a mental ray material. So go ahead and click on standard and then now you're going to have this mental ray option with a bunch of more materials down here. Whereas before on the scan line, we only had these top options and we were generally only using standard. So I'm going to go ahead and select arch and design. So that's architectural and design materials that are set up within mental ray already. And then I can select a template. And you'll see right here, Arc and Design, Mental Ray, so you know you're in the right place. So from the template, I can come down here and select Rubber. Okay, this beeping is starting to bother me in my headphones. So by double-clicking on that, you can see it's, it's kind of like Rubber, and actually it's going to be even nicer once we get into it. So I'll just click and drag that over onto the tire. I'll click and drag it over onto the tire text. And uh, I'm going to wait about that because if I just click and drag it, then the whole thing is going to turn into rubber. And I'm actually going to want that to be two separate materials. So I'm just going to undo that. The next material we're going to want to be the chrome. So for that, we can either go into Autodesk Metal. Uh, there's also Autodesk Metallic Paint. So like if you want it to be the same paint as the car, or if you want to put an edge of paint on it, then uh, that can be fun. Actually, that metallic paint is, is it's really quite nice, right? Like you, you can see little specks and flakes of uh, stuff going on there. Hey, let's even use that. Uh, we'll, we'll keep it nice and red. 
highlight spread. Oh, we'll leave that at default. Flex, we will have flex, keep them nice and small. We're going to have a slight chromatic pearl, so we're going to have pearlescent. And no matter what material you're using, turn on ambient occlusion. It might be under a category called special effects, right? If I come to over here to, to rubber, it's under special effects ambient occlusion. So we're, we're definitely going to want that to be on. The next material we're going to do is a chrome. So for that, we'll go to Autodesk Metal. And hey, we've got a chrome polished. No cutouts, ambient occlusion, yes. And we'll leave the rest there. So we've got these three materials here for us to use. This last one, I'm going to turn into that sub the, the, the sub material, right? The, the multi material. So in here, it's not under mental ray because you can have mental ray materials within as the sub materials within it. Uh, when I select a sub multi, it's going to ask, do you want to discard the old material that was in this slot or keep it? There was nothing there. So I'm just going to say, uh, well, it doesn't matter at all for me. I'll just discard. And that way everything here is blank. And now, this is going to be my uh, my sub object, and what I can do to double check which is supposed to be which is here under Polygon Material ID, I'm going to press one and click Select ID, so I can see that all those polygons are are uh, Material ID one, and if I say two Select ID, uh, I didn't blank my selection, so to select ID and it's just those nubs. So I want my rubber to be two and we're going to make that just a copy, actually an instance. So a copy will allow me to make changes to just that material and it will not affect what's happening to the tire rubber. If I make it an instance then they are the same rubber and any changes that happen to one happen to the uh, happens also to the other at the same time as though they are literally on the same uh, on the same slot and material ID 1 was where I want my chrome we're also going to make that a copy I'm going to put chrome just onto that and uh, or hey what would it look like Let's put that metallic paint on the stand. And then, without selecting any faces, we just grab this multi sub object, put that on, and you can see it's got the red paint there, it's got the rubber there. So, uh, we've okay, we've now got a good framing. So what we want is to always be able to come back to this framing should we move the, the camera around. So I'm going to press Control C for camera. And if you look at the top left of my screen, I'm now in camera one, not perspective, but camera one. Because what it did was when you're, whenever you're in perspective, you can always drop a camera to be exactly at that spot. So now if I zoom out, you can see I've got a camera here. And if I didn't model this out. This is what the default camera looks like in Max. And I can move around and do whatever work I want. And then just by pressing C for camera, I jump right into it. If I had multiple cameras, it would ask me, what camera do you want to go to? And it would give me the list of the cameras, which I can name, right? I can call this main cam or front cam or whatever I want to call it. So now that the camera is in place, I'm going to need to put in some lights because this is just default lighting and that's not that spectacular. So I come over to create, select the lights panel and I'm going to go in from photographic, switch over to standard and we're going to put in a couple of lights. So that's the Mr. Area Spot. So Mr. MR actually means mental ray. So that is a light that is specifically set up to be used with mental ray renderers. So it is a spotlight, so I can click and drag to where my target's going to be. And it's going to start off on a nice horizontal plane. 
So I'm just going to move this up a little bit. But you see, it's not making any difference, right? Even though I'm in realistic mode, nothing is changing. And the reason nothing is changing is because it's using the default lights, right? Illuminate with default lights. So by clicking here on realistic, the viewport view options, I can come to lighting and shadows, illuminate with scene lights with, and you want to make sure shadows and ambient occlusion are checkmarked. And now I've got a nice light. So I can move this light around and I can fiddle around with its properties. So I'm going to modify it just like I was modifying everything else. So we can say don't cast shadows, still using that light but not casting shadows, just going straight through. And speaking of shadows, I'm actually going to change this to Mental Ray Shadow Map. So if we're in Mental Ray, you talk Mental Ray, you stay Mental Ray, everything's Mental Ray. And then everything gets along. So a color, white can be a little bit shocking as a, as a color, so we're just going to give it a little bit, a little bit of color, keeping it nice and warm, and we're going to put another light in there that's kind of cool, right? More of a blue color. <coughs> the other thing we could change is attenuation. So attenuation is similar to decay in that the light is falling off, right? It gets, it gets, uh, light becomes less intense the farther you are away from it, right? You can see when I'm right up close, that's a really sharp, bright light, but as it gets farther and farther away, it's getting darker and darker and darker in an inverse uh, graph, right? So as the light gets farther away, it gets darker on a relatively linear uh, fashion. Real light goes by this inverse square. So it's actually the square of the distance that determines the, the, the fall off there. And you can see with mental ray lights and everything, you're getting some interesting coloration even in the shadows and everything. So um, instead, and that's very mathematic, uh, mathematical. If you know, uh, like if you're recreating a scene in a movie and you know the lights, you know the lumens of the lights, you know the camera lens, you know the positions of all these lights, you can recreate it to a T, literally photographic identically uh, by placing the lights where they're supposed to be in the scene. We're not doing that, so we're going to switch that to none and control it with, you can see there's kind of these blue lenses kind of that are inside, if I hide and selected. So you can see there's the square, that's the camera target, there's the cone, uh, not the camera target, the light target, there's the cone, that's the actual spotlight, and can tell us what kind of light it is. If it's a cylinder, it's directional. If it's a cone, it's a spot. And if it's a diamond, then it's omni, meaning it's shining in all directions. Uh, so we're going to play with these, uh, these blue lenses to play with that fall off instead of it being mathematical. So I'm going to use attenuation, and I'm going to have it end well past my object, well maybe not well past, a little past my object, just off the edge of the scene over here, and I'm going to have that attenuation start there. So right, it's, it's full brightness right up until it makes contact with this, and then it starts falling off rather quickly. And I may even want that ending to be farther away. You can play around with it, right? The, the, the distance of the light, the, dis the, the fall off range, that, uh, that can all be fun to play with. So I'm just going to hold shift and copy this light over. You notice it didn't move the target, uh, just with the light itself. So by selecting the bar, I should be able to move the light and target. So this one, 
is going to be on the opposite angle. Kind of getting, let's actually get this on target. You kind of want the target of the light and or the camera to be on what it's supposed to be shining at, right? Because that way I can grab this light and move it around and it's always going to be pointing, no matter what I do, at that tire. So I'm going to kind of have that like that. This one is not going to cast shadows because cross shadows looks rather weird. And actually this one's going to be more of a top-down light. Kind of from the back and we can check this. We go into camera. And we're actually going to restore some viewports. So we can have the camera over here, which is going to continue doing all this good stuff. But what I can do is grab this light and start playing around with it. All right, so I actually think over that's pretty good. No, that's fine. You know what? We're not going to spend two hours on this just setting up a couple of lights. That's pretty good. We've got a, a main light. We've got a hot light. Uh, so this one, actually, we're going to crank up a little bit. Oh, it's already a multiplier two. So let's crank this one down a little bit. Let's just put that to one. This one up here, we're going to make a more cool color. Something like that. Come back to this frame. Okay, uh, the next material, I've opened the material editor by pressing M for material. So next we're going to want to put uh, material on the floor and on the wall. So again, we're going to say material, let's do the wall and ceramic. <clears throat> Oh, is it ceramic or is there tile? Let's see, let's see. Well, here, we can put in the Autodesk hardwood. So you can see like there's different kinds, the stain, so you can actually have it a little bit of a color stain. We've got a glossy varnish, so we'll put a semi-gloss as a flooring material as opposed to um, furniture material. Uh, the relief pattern is going to be based on the wood grain. Yes, we do want uh, ambient occlusion. And just to look at what happens here, let's just press F9, get a quick render. It's only going to take a moment and see already we're getting some nice things. So you see these squares that are working around. The number of squares that you have in the area that you can cover is going to depend on some of the settings down here and also on your, uh, your uh, CPU, your computer's processor. So I've got a um, Core i7 quad core with hyper threading. So I actually have eight boxes running around here that um, that are getting that done. So I don't need to see this whole thing. I just needed to see a little part of that. So I'm just going to press escape to cancel rendering. Uh, and you can see I'm not getting any kind of a, a good pattern in there. That wood is too big, I believe. So 0.1 by 0.1. There we go. So already I can see that there's there's some stuff going on. How about 0 0.4, 0.4? Uh, 0.6.6. 6.
just give him a hair. Okay, this is uh, not looking good. So what we're going to do is make sure that this gets unwrapped correctly. So UV map, make it a box. You know, actually, even just a, a planer will do because just a vertical planer is fine. And then we can check this size. Aha, uh -huh, yeah, you see that's getting enormous there. That's getting silly. So we're just going to set that back to one and one. Close that. And instead, we are going to play with some of these numbers. Sometimes very small changes can make very large changes. So just. Be careful of that. And we can rotate this also. All right, if we take the UV map gizmo, we can rotate that. So that it kind of lines up with the wall, I suppose. And we're going to make one last one, which is going to be It was ceramic, was it not ceramic? Uh, maybe it was not. Okay. Uh, I thought it was ceramic, but it's actually in our design. And then down here, we've got glazed ceramic tiles. So in these glazed ceramic tiles, Again, special effects, ambient occlusion. So, um, because there's tiles, there's some very interesting settings. And we're going to make sure we see that realistically. And we'll drag that over. Okay, no, there we go. Okay. I don't see. No, select the. Is that net? I don't selected. And hey, let's just uh, maximize this viewport. So, we've got some different setups we can do. So we can do different patterns of tiles. So a running bond is kind of this traditional. Uh, offset brickwork, right, that we see, well, I see a lot here in North America. I'm not sure if you're going to see it uh, a lot where you live, but, um, and if we do, uh, oops. there, there's kind of your standard brick pattern. It's called running bond. Then we've got common Flemish bond. I'll just give it a minute. Will update. There you go. So you may just need to click over here. So you see this way you've got the small brick in between slightly larger square bricks and uh, alternating between thin square and rectangular as uh, row to row. An English bond. Again, just give it a minute. There you go, so a bunch of the thin ones with longer rectangular ones alternating back and forth. A half running bond. So you see it's not quite to the midpoint of the brick, it's just a little bit of an offset and it goes uh, in a zigzag as opposed to, you know, equally spaced along the diagonal. 
I really think my headphones are about to die off, which is strange because they've been charging for a day and a half. Uh, stack bond is going to be stacked one on top of the other, um, which is good for bathrooms, for instance. A free running bond, or sorry, a fine running bond, is this fun little double stack of thin ones, which I like. Um, uh, I rather like that design with a vertical, long vertical being intersected by a thin one, and then this, which is also very bathroom or kitchen like. So let's go ahead with a fine running bond. And we're going to increase its tiling. So its tiling is how it's going to repeat. So you can start just dragging it up, although that can, that can be weird in a lot of senses. And that's tiling 2.6 times by 2.4 times. You might just want to do 2 tab 2. And uh, there you go. Also, in advanced controls, uh, you can set up a tile texture. So right now, the tiles themselves are just white. So we can say that the tiles are going to be... Hmm, actually, I can make some really interesting tiles. Like... Uh, what have we got? What have we got? Yeah, I've got hundreds of textures. It's probably a good idea for for you to start making your own little collection. Oh, we could have some funky tiles like that. No, no, we're just gonna we're just gonna leave that as is. Color the the texture on the surface of the tiles is not terribly important. Fine running, we're just going to turn that off, keep that white. Color variance. Uh, so yes, uh, we're just going to put in a color. We're going to make them kind of blue. Hmm, what's going on here? I'm losing performance here. Maybe even a darker... Whoa, what's going on here? Okay, something doesn't like me. So color variance. So if we have like a color variance of 0.5, again, just give it a moment to update because this is a dynamic system. So that's how I got the color variations in there. It's just using this glazed ceramic tiles and switching that over. And we've got the grout set up so we can set up what color and uh, what texture and bump map is going to be on the on the grout in between the tiles. We can uh, we can put some randomness in it. So this has got a random seed of 1190. So we can say uh, 4589. It really doesn't matter what the number is because it's just a random seed. So it's just kind of. <clears throat> creating some randomness depending on what number you're putting in there. But that's that's good enough. So I'm going to go ahead and unhide all. Press C to go to the camera. So this all looks fine and dandy, but when you're rendering it might be a lot darker, a lot lighter, and you might not be able to determine why that is really. So to do that, we're going to click on rendering and go to exposure control. So just like controlling a camera, you need to set up the exposure control. So I'm, you're probably on either no exposure control or automatic exposure control. Automatic tends to work fairly well, but won't calculate properly in a lot of instances. For instance, if you're using the mental ray <laughs> renderer. So I'm gonna go ahead and select Mr. Photographic Exposure Control, which actually means mental ray photographic exposure control, right? And click render preview. Now that render preview is, cannot be interrupted, so just click it, let it run, uh, don't set your settings too high, and that's another reason why we keep things low settings until we're done and we're ready to put it out, because uh, it does take normal render time for it to figure it out. 
but once it has it figured out here in this little box you can change around these photographic exposure settings for to make it um, uh, to, to, to see the final result so I kind of know my cameras so I know that I can fiddle around with these we're gonna go to an f5.6 uh, a film speed of uh, 200 and then we can crank that somewhere about to there right because over here it's totally blanked out right it's it's too bright it looks ridiculous but you look at the render preview and that's more what you're going to get as your as your output so i can now minimize that i'll minimize this and uh, let's get a render going so just hit f9 and let's see what we got so this time i'm going to let it run and so depending on your render settings and you can see a bunch of the render settings here the others are in the f9 um, the higher you crank these the longer it's going to take to complete so right now i'm already only at a quarter of the render is done and it's, it's working its way through so with default scan line it's literally a scan line that works its way down the page that fills in little bits at a time getting all the information it can be quite quick but it can be fairly inaccurate here what we've done instead is with mental ray you see there's little like octagons here basically so that's the uh the, what's called the final gather so first it looks in a very general wide sense what light is hitting me what what what, what are my sensors getting and it breaks it up into small little bits of those octagons which gives just kind of the general lighting concept and gets the quick calculation done and then it goes in and it looks finer and finer and finer of uh, refining that down to um, to the, the the fine detail and exactly what light is bouncing off of where and speaking of bounces, one of those things that you're gonna to wanna to turn on that's gonna greatly increase the quality of your renders is these FG bounces. So that's literally light bouncing. So normally in, uh, in the real world, you take in light through your eyes, but it's that light has gone through so many different objects before it gets to your eye. So it comes down off the sky, it, uh, it's going to hit the the table it's going to grab a little bit of that color as it reflects off and then you see like if you have a, a red tablecloth butted up against a red wall you'll see the red on the wall that's because of the photons that are grabbing some of the red information and carrying it with it onto the next object and then it hits that object it grabs some of that information and it keeps going and it grabs some of the next until it finishes all of its bounces and reaches your eye the more bounces you have the more complex it's going to be and obviously that light is going to be bouncing in different directions to hit these different objects so um, it, it, it really does become infinitely more complex as those bounces go up but if you want to add that little bit of realism put fg bounces to two or four or six um, you don't have to do even numbers i often just choose even numbers you could just do a single bounce so that it grabs the red off of that table and it brings it to the wall but uh there you go so that's uh your basic tire with a rim in the stand some quick mental ray materials thrown in there and the render i hope you enjoyed what you saw and uh i hope i filled in another blank and uh maybe made that uh not too challenging for you to to get the uh car rim in there and uh hopefully that gives you a couple of ideas to keep on moving so uh i will keep in mind about what i'm going to be doing for my next tutorial i'm not quite sure what i'm going to be doing so uh, if you have any ideas please let me know Actually, there was one fellow that wanted to see what I could do with the house in the original, so I might be making some windows and doors and such. 
So um, I will see you next time. Thank you very much for tuning in. Have a good evening.